Uh, just before I move into to Daniel picking up a, a little further in where we were with our limited reunion symbolism of uh, of uh, exile and uh, yet with the recollection involved of God's uh, covenant with Abraham. So that's the situation as uh, we all know obtained right right from the beginning to the end. The, the two tracks, the works up there, the great down here. And we were just looking at the situation at the end of that or toward the end of that where uh, exile is experienced. Where, where the there's a this disruption in, in the, the, the history of God's uh, people with him during this this exile, and so what we're saying is that uh, the, the, the exile is, is depicted by the limitations on, on the marriage relationship, and yet the fact that continuing even during this rupture in, in uh, the uh, typological situation uh, is, is the reunion itself. So I have the mixed metaphor to bring out uh, the two things. Well, uh, actually have the same kind of anomaly early on before they even get into the land. Huh? Uh, they have the exodus uh, from Egypt and they're on the, uh, on the way to the land and the marriage has taken place all right at Sinai. And, uh, the, but then you know, the 40 years. Now there you have the 70 years of exile that's being, that's being symbolized in beyond the, in, in Hosea's experience. Now here you have the, the 40 years in, in the wilderness. That was an exile before they got there. Hmm? They were kicked out of the land virtually before they arrived uh, because of, of their uh, rebellion against the Lord. And the interesting thing I just wanted to add as a supplement to our other discussion is the kind of mixed metaphor uh, that you, you get in, uh, uh, to bring out the nature of what was God's relationship to Israel and during those 40 years uh, where they were not in the land. They had made covenant uh, with him and, and uh, yet he keeps them out of uh, the land. It's a, as I say, it's an anticipatory kind of exile before they have even gotten there. What's interesting, I think, is the way the divine presence uh, relates uh, to Israel during the, the, this period. Uh, and here that whole question of Exodus 32 and 33 comes up. Uh, again, you remember where God threatens uh, that uh, uh, he will no longer uh, go up with his people uh, and uh, he will send his angel before them, but not the, the glory, spirit, panim, parousia, presence of God will no longer uh, be with them. Well, right, right there you see you have a, a, a mixture of, of things. There's a presence and not a presence. Uh, uh, there is a not a presence, the, the, the glory spirit will, will not be there, and that's telling them that, that, that they have broken covenant, that, that they're outside the, the full terms of the, the covenant, and yet his angel will be with them, his angel will go before them, and so he remembers the Abrahamic promises, and he's, he's going to fulfill them, and he's, he's, he's going to bring them in, into uh, the land after the, the 40 years are up, but meanwhile it's a mixed situation, the mixed situation uh, it also takes the form of the of the, the fact that uh, after Moses prays, and not only the angel should go before them, but that the, the Lord's uh, glory cloud should be there. And okay, we'll even go that far. We'll even go that far to have the, the glory cloud uh, in the, the midst of you to bring out the thought that uh, we haven't forgotten the Abrahamic covenant. There is a, a better day coming, but the glory cloud will not be in the middle of the camp. So it's, uh, that's like Hosea's marriage. It's marriage, but separation. The glory cloud is with you, but outside the camp. And, uh, and, and so it's very consistent, I think, the, the, the way in which God portrays this, this mixed situation uh, in, in symbolic ways that are simultaneously saying, I remember the Abrahamic covenant, but meanwhile, you have fallen under judgment under the, the uh, works covenant. So this Hosea thing would not be an isolated thing. It's, it's part of an overview. And I think the helpfulness of this is that it helps us in our own mind to be reconstructing this whole history of the covenant relationship, which uh, is then important. Okay. Well, now then we uh, uh, come to the uh, book of Daniel. And in this uh, case, I usually try to say a, a few words of in, uh, general introduction about the, the question of date and authorship. For the most part, of course, as you realize, I, I leave that to your 
reading and the, the introductions by Harrison or whichever one you're, uh, you happen to be using. Uh, but in the case of uh, the, the Daniel, it's one of those major problems that have divided the, the, the Orthodox uh, Old Testament scholars from the uh, critics. So that there's the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, of course, and there's the, the Isianic uh, question, the unity of the book of Isaiah, which is challenged. And, and, and the origin of the book of Daniel as something written in the 6th century in, in Babylon, uh, conservative view, the prima facie representation of the book itself about its own origins. Uh, that view, of course, uh, absolutely challenged by the, the modern critical view, which uh, dates it not in the 6th century, but in the 2nd century. Not in Babylon, but in Palestine. So, uh, at least in its you know, finished Greek form, uh, one of those uh, so-called assured results of modern criticism long since was that the Book of Daniel was a product of the uh, of second century Palestinian experience of God's uh, people. And uh, that is just taken for granted uh, as, a, as a given uh, beyond argument in uh, modern discussions of uh, the book of, of Daniel, there's a big volume of <coughs> Daniel studies that the library just got hold of a big couple of glancing uh, through and, and this point of view is just taken for granted uh, in, in article after article. And uh, we find even then that the, the, the impact of this in conservative, what you'd expect to be better circles where there is a, a disposition to uh, to yield on the subject and, and to be a little more open and compromising on it than, than really is a, is a, a call for, but uh, that kind of impact is so there. Some like F.F. F. Bruce, for example, uh, was, uh, said things in, in, in that direction about the, the final composition of the Book of Daniel. So what is it then that uh, has uh, uh, seemed to be such powerful argument or evidence uh, that has re resulted in in this uh, sad state of affairs. And I'll just try to outline them, uh, a few of the main considerations. And then again, again you do have your, your, your reading in the, in the uh, introductions that you're reading that uh, Harrison does a good job of, uh, of uh, this. We just want to supplement a little bit what you will uh, be finding there. And uh, I, I would say that first of all, uh, the, the thing that leads to this uh, Palestinian second century and dating of the, the book it has to do with the feature of predictive prophecy. Predictive prophecy in in, uh, in, uh, in this book in, uh, in, in the book of Daniel. And, and bottom line, in, in short, the uh, the thought is that the, the book of Daniel shows itself to be too well informed about events in the second century BC. In the second century BC too well informed about events in the second century BC to have been written in the sixth century BC. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And of course, the, the, the bias, the assumption is, it, 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 it simply that predictive prophecy is not possible, all right? So, so coming with that naturalistic presupposition and finding in the book of Daniel detailed uh, analysis of, of events in generation after generation or dynasty after dynasty in the second century of BC, uh, the modern mind re re refuses to accept that you, you would have genuine prophecy uh, 400 years earlier, that, that uh, could be, especially when you come to, <coughs> to chapter 11. Well, you know, you, even if you, you have dealt with chapter 11, which admittedly is uh, very much concerned with events in, in the second century BC, uh, <coughs> uh, and, and you would date the book of Daniel in the second century BC to take care of that, you still haven't touched the messianic prophecies that we would, I trust, uh, see in, in the book, uh, which were uh, later on. And so you still have genuine prediction uh, with respect to those messianic and, and new covenant uh, realities. But the, the, the modern critic will be rereading all of that as well. But meanwhile, it's the 11th chapter especially, and I don't know, I, I trust you're reading through all of these prophetical books in connection with this course and that you're getting more and more familiar with Daniel in particular, but in the 11th chapter, you remember, it is this uh, really remarkable kind of thing in terms uh, maybe of just about unique even within the Bible. 
of an, an account of, of events running right through well, it's the times of the of the Ptolemies and the, the, the Seleucids after the breakup of Alexander's uh, uh, empire into, into four parts, and then the, the, which is symbolized in, uh, in Daniel 8 and, and so on. Uh, the two of those four parts, what you have in, in Syria with the, the rule of the Seleucid kings, and then what you have in Egypt with the, the Ptolemies, those, those two become the most conspicuous in terms of biblical affairs because, the, of course, Palestine is sandwiched right in between those two, and, and the, the, they were uh, seesawing back and, and forth and trying to gain control over the uh, Palestinian uh, location which was in, in between them, namely the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And so this went on and on uh, through a whole succession of, of events which uh, Daniel 11 traces in, in amazing detail in terms of international intermarriages and covenants and military campaigns and it is just too extensive and too detailed uh, for the, the modern mind to accept that this can be anything uh, except a, a, a history written after the events but cast in, in the phony form of a prophecy that had been given before but in any case meanwhile and that they, this leads to definitely to take the material in the second century BC. So the feature of, of predictive prophecy, now, you know, if, if you read in their commentaries, they're not going to put it the way I just put it as bluntly as that, but it's a question of their bias against supernaturalism that leads them to, to that, but uh, you, you know that that's what, what's going on down deep in their guts. That's the, the thing that uh, is, is leading them to their conclusions. Um, by the way, that, that particular form of, of uh, narrative that you have in, 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 Genesis, in, in uh, Daniel 11, where you have a whole sort of analytic, almost chronicle, chronicle type of, of an, uh, a history of a whole succession of unnamed kings, and you, you can identify them if you, if you know what's going on, but they aren't named. That particular form of, of literature actually uh, has been shown now to have uh, become current in the, the, the days where the Bible would date Daniel. I, I would see it as a, the fact that, the, that this kind of uh, narrative is in Daniel 11 and, and that the, the, it was in, in his days that this type of, of narrative began to be produced only, of course, outside the Bible. It actually was an account that was written after the events and was... Uh, just falsely projected back as a prophecy. But nevertheless, that, that form of writing uh, is uh, characteristic of Daniel's time. And then, of course, the critics didn't have to say, oh, yeah, but it, it, it continued to be there that down to the second uh, uh, century. But uh, all right. Now, one thing, of course, uh, the, uh, that can be brought to bear by way of, of uh, objective evidence in the case of of this dating of Daniel in the second century uh, BC uh, is the, the Dead, Ski, Dead Sea Scroll, the Qumran uh, material, and, and the manuscripts that have been found there in the first and the fourth and the sixth and the eleventh uh, caves at, at Qumran. Uh, manuscripts or fragments uh, of manuscripts of, of Daniel uh, have been uh, found, and including. Uh, uh, some that, that span the breaks in, in, you know, the book of Daniel starts with the you know, Hebrew moves to Aramaic and then comes back to Hebrew with the joints at 2 4 and the, the, between chapter 7 and 8. And in some of these Dead Sea uh, fragments actually have, have texts which span those joints even from one language to the other without any indication, you know, that, the, that there was ever any separation uh, between them. So, if, in any case, you have this kind of manuscript evidence now. Uh, and it's a question of the dating of, of some of them are earlier and some later. But, you know, from the point of view of the liberal, the, the, this becomes so dangerously close to having actually manuscripts, which are clearly the, the originals, uh, but, but copies, which come from the time when, to which they are attributing the, the authorship of the book. So you, you can see uh, how objective textual documentary problems are are, are uh, available here that, uh, that that should make the, the critics to be as dogmatic then about their dating of the, the origin of, uh, of the book. Well, that was point one. They, they, date the, they date the book of Daniel in the second century because they say it knows too much about the second century that you have been written earlier. Secondly, the second argument is that uh, the book of Daniel shows itself to be too ill-informed on the 6th century, 
uh, events to have been written in the 6th century. Uh, all of the mistakes, the historical blunders, allegedly, that are found in the book of Daniel forbid our thinking that uh, a contemporary of these events uh, uh, has uh, written them for them. This demands uh, the, the, the passage of centuries and, and uh, the, the loss of accurate memory of what things really were like back in the 6th century. So it's sort of the opposite of the first argument. And, and well, what to make of, of, of this? It's a question now of, of a whole series of uh, alleged historical blunders in the book of Daniel, which uh, have to be treated then one by one. And so your introductions will do that for you. For, for generations, conservative scholars have been crossing swords with the liberals on, on issue after issue. And you know, for, uh, we, we think of Robert Dick Wilson back at the Princeton and his, his studies in the book of Daniel and, and uh, on through the whole succession of orthodox conservative Old Testament scholarship has been been dealing uh, with these uh, issues. You know, they, they begin even with the opening verses in the book of Daniel and, and the uh, campaign of Nebuchadnezzar uh, against the city in connection with which Daniel himself was uh, taken captive and, and the, the, the assumption that, you know, this just doesn't fit into the whole career of Nebuchadnezzar and his uh, activities and uh, all the uh, things that handled that. I remember years ago, uh, um, George Ernest Wright, one of the successors of William Foxwell Albright, uh, and uh, teaching at Harvard and wrote his book on biblical archaeology, in which he uh, and he repeated these allegations about the, the opening uh, uh, verses in Daniel. And I reviewed uh, that, that biblical archaeology book for the Westminster Journal at that time, and and and, and took him up on. On, on this particular thing in the light of, of uh, Donald Wiseman's recent publication of the Babylonian Chronicles, huh? uh, which uh, had shown that uh, the, the, as far as Daniel 1 was concerned, it, it, it wasn't at all difficult to fit in such an, uh, a campaign into the career of Nebuchadnezzar, which, more of, which one of, of more than one possibilities uh, was present the right one. And, uh, so I, I spent some time in the, in the, the review uh, criticizing it uh, on that account, and uh, it's the only time that the author of a book has ever written that, that I wrote a review for, ever then wrote to me complaining. <laughs> His complaint that I, I spent too much time criticizing you on, on that point. Well, that wasn't the question. It was a question of whether criticism was right or not. But, uh, uh, so, specific problems that are, are being dealt with one after another, uh, but the, the main one we'll, we'll, we'll focus on uh, here today, and again, this I imagine uh, Harrison treats to some extent, I haven't checked recently, but uh, uh, we want to supplement it in any case, and then this has to do with a big major thing concerning the whole structure of, of a history. Now, uh, this problem of the succession of Near Eastern world empires we encounter in Daniel 2 in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar about the image of gold, silver, and etc. And in, in Daniel 7, in, in Daniel's uh, vision of the, the kingdoms in terms of, the, of the, the four beasts. And so we will be encountering that and, and we'll be arguing, you know, for for the view that uh, Babylon is uh, the first kingdom, you Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, all right? So that's pretty clear. And uh, then the, the, the second kingdom, represented by uh, the, the breast of silver and so on in chapter 2, or uh, by the second beast, the bear, in uh, chapter 7, is the Medo-Persian kingdom. Under Cyrus. <clears throat> and then the third kingdom, would be Greece, and the fourth would be Rome. And when we come to uh, work on those two chapters more indirectly, uh, then we'll have to, uh, you, you know, be a little more precise when we come to the fourth kingdom and recognize that there are two stages in the depiction of the fourth kingdom, both in chapter two and in uh, chapter seven. In, ch in chapter two, you have the distinction between the, the legs of iron uh, which is uh, stage A, and the feet of iron and clay, which is stage B. And in uh, chapter 7, you have the distinction between uh, this uh, nameless uh, draconic uh, beast uh, uh, with uh, the uh, ten horns, where section A, 
and then the emergence of the little horn and uh, the, his whole career, which would be SHB. So there's, a, there's that refining of uh, that. But meanwhile, these are the these are, are the, the four main empires uh, the, that uh, our exegesis will uh, I, I, I be identifying. Now, among critics, you, you can well imagine that they don't want the, the prophecy to be going any farther than necessary, this feature of predictive prophecy. They don't mind it going down to the second century BC when they, they say the book was uh, written, but that, that stops them with Greece. Huh? You, they don't want to get down uh, to Rome. And uh, so their interpretation of the passage has, has been that Babylon is the first, a, a median kingdom, and, and here's the, the problem, a median kingdom that never existed. Uh, a, a median kingdom uh, was the second one, and then the Persians be the third one, and Greece would be the, 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 the fourth kingdom. So that, would, that has been the, the uh, typical sort of liberal interpretation of, of uh, the passage. With Greece, and as I said, uh, headed up by Alexander the Great, and yet when Alexander then dies and his kingdom is divided into those four parts with this, uh, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies in chapter 11 and all that. Okay. Now, this being their, their interpretation of, of the, the passage, what they end up uh, doing is uh, saying, okay, that, that's clearly what the book of Daniel is saying, but that betrays a, a, a big blank in the knowledge of what happened between the Babylonians and the Persians, because there never was. There never was, the liberals are telling us, and uh, this is happens to be right, there never was a, a, a separate median kingdom ruling over uh, the area of Babylon and so on, uh, between the demise of the Babylonians and, and the and the initiation of, of the, the, the Persians under, under Cyrus. Now, the book of Daniel has created them, we, we are told. The book of Daniel has created this phase of history that never existed. And this, you know, you, you have to give a little substance to the thing. You have to work a king into the thing. And so they had to create a king uh, for that period. And so they created Darius the Mede. And the critical view is, there never was a Darius to me. There is no such person. And so that, that is one huge problem. Then you can see one way or, or, or the other, if the critics are right, that, that, that certainly is a, a major uh, blunder. And then that's the position they, 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 they take. And so their view is it. No one in the sixth century would have been that stupid. It, it, uh, it must have been written in the sixth century. Okay. So this becomes the big historic, the major historical question. And what I want to do at this point is to make use of, of the contribution of Donald Wiseman to this particular problem. And uh, it, it constitutes the first chapter in a collection of essays that were produced uh, by uh, some of our British friends uh, under the title of uh, Notes on Some Problems in the Book of Daniel. And that's the title of the, the book. Notes on some problems in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> it's not a catchy title that would sell over three million copies right away, uh, like to the late great planet Earth or something like that. <laughs> it's more valuable, okay. All right. And uh, with, a, with a series of editors like Wiseman and, and Titchen, uh, and after a bit we'll be talking about the, the whole argument. Uh, of date based on the language, the Aramaic and the Hebrew in the book of Daniel, and we'll be looking at the material that was uh, written by uh, Kenneth Kitchen in this same volume uh, on that subject. In fact, his article on the Aramaic of the book of Daniel is by far the largest uh, essay here. But the, the opening chapter now in this thing uh, it was written by Wiseman, Donald J. Wiseman, uh, the Syriologist. We, we talked about Kenneth Kitchen, I guess. And, yeah. And he was an Egyptologist and uh, taught at Liverpool, who was telling me that he's retired, I guess now. And, uh, and uh, Donald Wiseman, is he still living? Uh, and uh, Donald Wiseman, who is a seriologist and done top notch stuff a moment ago, I just mentioned the, the Babylonian Chronicles, which he edited. And, and uh, so he is a world class a seriologist fellow. And he wrote this article. Uh, and it's called Some Historical Problems in the Book of Daniel. First essay. 
and let me just read a bit from it. Uh, the paragraph is headed, Darius the Mead. Okay, he confronts now the, the challenge of Darius the Mead. The problem, <coughs> uh, the, the reference is to Darius the Mead in the book of Daniel, the law been recognized as providing the most serious historical problem in the book. Sure would be if it were true. And yet the Bible clearly declares that after the death of the Chaldean king Belshazzar, think of Daniel 5 and, and the, the handwriting on the wall and Belshazzar the king and the end, end of his uh, kingdom. And, and uh, af after that, uh, clearly Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. That's Daniel 5, verses 30 and 31. So Belshazzar is uh, eliminated and he's replaced by Darius the Mede. Uh, and then details about this Darius. He's the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes, who became king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Chapter 9, verse 1. He said, over the kingdom, 120 satraps, uh, and over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was one, uh, to whom the others should give account, and so on. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Daniel held a position of authority, at least during the first year in Babylon, of this king, 6, 1 and 9, 1. And according to the traditional translation of 628. Now, 628 becomes a, a little key verse in, in the discussion. According to the usual translation of uh, Daniel 628, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, Darius the Meteor, and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So that uh, translation then uh, seemingly to predicate uh, that Daniel had experience first under Darius the Mede, and then he had experience uh, under Cyrus, uh, the, the Persian. <coughs> the proper translation of that verse it will, will, will be a, a feature, of course, of Wiseman's uh, uh, argument. <coughs> and thus Darius the Mede appears to have been succeeded by Cyrus. <coughs> this verse is considered the clearest evidence of the book's belief in a Median empire between the Babylonian and the Persian. Now, on the other hand, then he goes on to point out the available evidence that we have, and he, he is observing how, you know, as a matter of fact, the, the, the Belshazzar, <coughs> the Belshazzar of Daniel 5, uh, was co-regent with his father, Nabonidus. Uh, Nabonidus was the last king, but had an erratic uh, career, and meanwhile, uh, his son Belshazzar, as the Bible portrays him, was the, the king in place in, 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 in Babylon. And... Um, the, uh, the accounts of the conquest of the, the city uh, then, uh, let, let's see, the last Chaldean king of Babylon, Abednego, who died sometime after the entry of, and now we have a fellow named Ugbaru, U-G-B-A-R-U, uh, who uh, led the army of Cyrus into Babylon uh, to conquer the city. So Cyrus is the conqueror, but he has a general named Ugbaru who actually leads uh, uh, the troops in. Uh, meanwhile, Cyrus remained outside for a while, but then present, uh, soon afterwards he entered the city, so there was no great gap in time. According to the contemporary text, Cyrus was the one who, uh, who conquered Babylon and Belshazzar and, and the days there of, of Nabonidus as well. And uh, it, soon after his general took the city, uh, Cyrus himself moved into the city, and uh, there was no room for some separate Median kingdom at, at all between the fall of Babylon and uh, and, and Cyrus, and that, of course, is true. There, there wasn't room for any uh, such uh, 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 kingdom. Well, uh, th that's his conclusion. There is thus no room for the re there is thus no room for the reign of a king Darius or for a Median Empire uh, between the fall of the Chaldean dynasty and the inauguration of this uh, new thing under Cyrus. Uh, now, we might as well say uh, that uh, once, you know, that if you look elsewhere in, in the Bible. Uh, in the book of Daniel, it, it too recognizes uh, consistently uh, that uh, after the fall of Babylon, uh, there was not a separate Median kingdom. As a matter of fact, it makes rather clear that what followed, however, was a legal person hyphenated uh, a combination of uh, uh, a kingdom. Uh, for example, Belshazzar uh, falls and he's uh, succeeded by someone right away who is ruling how? According to the laws of the Medes period? Oh no, the, the, the immediate successor of, of Belshazzar is uh, someone who rules according to the laws of the Medes of the Persians. So the, the, 
the, the perspective of the Book of Daniel is definitely one that corresponds to the historical realities. Uh, it, it does not fit in with it. Whatever the explanation that arrives the Mead, uh, in, in where he has mentioned, the, the, the Book of Daniel as a whole certainly recognizes the, the, the true state of affairs. Once again, in Daniel 8, we have some detailed symbolism of uh, the, the ram and the he goat and so on to represent the Medo-Persian kingdom and, and, and uh, Alexander's kingdom, the Greeks and so on. And uh, there there is a specific identification of, of uh, the, the kingdom that, uh, that, uh, that follows the Babylonian one in, in terms of, of, of a duality, uh, which again reflects a clear knowledge uh, that the successor of Babylon and Belshazzar was a, a, a Medo-Persian uh, king, kingdom. So it's only here in really what is being said about Darius the Mede uh, that any question uh, could emerge. Well, what about that then? Who, who is this uh, Darius the Mede? And in these ongoing discussions, I mentioned Robert Duke Wilson and his studies in the book of Daniel. And uh, so he would be arguing on, on, on one side over him. And, and I think on this particular subject, even someone like uh, uh, Albright was in agreement uh, with uh, Wilson, or Wilson was in agreement with Albright, as, as over against others. Uh, and uh, one of the most popular ways of handling this is then uh, that Darius the Mede was interpreted as being one of the subordinates of Cyrus. Now, soon after the city was taken by this general Ugbaru, uh, uh, the, the contemporary texts uh, then, then speak about, this is puzzling, whether this is the same one or a different uh, one. Apparently, it's a, it's a different, not Ugbaru, but Gubbaru, uh, is, is functioning as sort of a governor in Babylon, although then more recent studies have challenged uh, whether this uh, Gubaru's governorship uh, began right away or only four years of later. But in any case, when Wilson and, and others were arguing the fact that uh, they, they thought that they could uh, deal with this Gubaru as someone who was immediately established under Cyrus in control of the situation in Babylon, and that the Bible then calls him by the name uh, Darius the Mede. So that was. Uh, perhaps the favorite solution uh, among conservatives uh, right down to the, the time that Wiseman wrote this article, and maybe there are many conservatives that still favor this. As a matter of fact, the one who continues to favor it and wrote a doctoral dissertation on this subject was the, the John Whitcomb, you know, of Whitcomb and Morris of uh, flood geology fame. Hmm? You're all familiar with him? Uh, so he, he, he wrote this uh, dissertation uh, in, in which he uh, it, it, did some good stuff, much better than his flood geology stuff, uh, on, on the, the subject of, uh, and, and he defended then uh, this view that it uh, was, uh, was this Gubaro fellow, uh, would be Darius uh, the Mead. H.H. Uh, Rowley, R-O-W-L-E-Y, I don't know if we've mentioned him this year, he, he was a British author, not, you know, he was on the, the moderately liberal side of things, he wasn't certainly orthodox. And, uh, oh, in fact, let's see, you, you used his book for the Servant of the Lord thing, didn't you? Okay, all right, so you're familiar with him. And uh, so you know that his views are, are not straight north. Now, one other thing, book that he wrote was the, the book uh, uh, Darius the Mede and the Four World Empires of the Book of Daniel. Darius the Mede and the Four World Empires of the Book of Daniel, which he dedicated to the unknown author of Daniel, I think. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Rubbing it in a little. And, uh, in, in this book, then, he does a, a, a good critique, as Wiseman uh, acknowledges, uh, of all of the, the uh, attempts to identify someone as Darius the Mede, including the Kubaru theory and, and several others, and he shows that the, the difficulties uh, with any uh, of uh, those. Okay, so Wiseman then picks it up from there. There have been these views, uh, Rowley and others uh, perhaps uh, um, demolished. Uh, these other suggestions, where does that leave us? Uh, does it leave us then that uh, we have this really big historical blunder in the book of Dan? Weissman says no, and uh, his conclusion in, in, in brief is uh, that uh, Darius the Mede is not some subordinate uh, of, of uh, Cyrus, let alone some preceding king altogether, uh, but that he is Cyrus the Persian. So. Uh, uh, according to Wiseman, Darius the Mede is an alternative designation of Cyrus the Persian, 
And uh, so this uh, begins then with uh, the, the, the right translation of that the verse in Daniel 6.28, uh, that Daniel prospered under the reign of Darius the Mede and under the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And it's simply a question of the, the Hebrew vav, the and, uh, the and. Uh, and uh, should it be translated and, or, or should it be translated as the appositional or epiclegetical vav, meaning even, and uh, it, definitely it should be the latter. And so it's, it's not and uh, the reign of Cyrus the Persian, uh, but it identifies uh, the two, that Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius uh, uh, the, the Mede, uh, that is, in, in the reign of how he is better known to you, perhaps, as, as Cyrus uh, the Persian, so that the text would be equating these two. And it's, it's a common and, uh, enough uh, phenomenon in, in the Hebrew, uh, and the uh, passage uh, in um, in First Chronicles um, five twenty six, I, I believe it is, is uh, is a parallel uh, which speaks uh, about. Uh, let's see, uh, yeah, yeah, First Chronicle, yeah, five twenty six. First Chronicles five twenty six. In, in earlier translations of this, before the historical documentation became available, uh, the translation was so. The God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, P-U-L, Pul, king of Assyria, and then the, the Vav, and the spirit of Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and uh, so it sounded like uh, God was stirring up two separate uh, kings, Pul and Tiglath-Pileser. Now the evidence is abundant that, that these are the same guy. Uh, the two names for the same person and so we, we now translate the verse uh, that God stirred up the spirit of full king of Assyria, that is even uh, the spirit of uh, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria. So that's the starting point then uh, that the, the Daniel doesn't separate these two but actually identifies uh, them one with this. Now from that point it becomes simply a question of uh, trying to demonstrate as Wiseman does uh, the, the, the various data associated with Darius the Mede in, in Daniel would be true of, uh, of Cyrus the Persian, in, including the, what is the number of how, about how old he was when he received the, uh, the kingdom, and, uh, and uh, that fits in just about perfectly with our known dates for Cyrus the Persian, who would have been born about 600 BC, and by about 539, 538, which is uh, when uh, he conquered the, the Babylonian Empire, he would have been, what is it, the 52 years old or whatever it says that, that he was. So th this kind of data, and the fact that he's called uh, the Mede, uh, uh, Wiseman finds uh, evidence for in, in a document that comes uh, Oh, some 10 years before 539, before the passage, before what we're concerned with here, in which uh, Cyrus, and it couldn't be anyone else, is referred to as the king of the Medes. Uh, so, you know, he, what Cyrus had done, done was to unite the, 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 the previously separate Median and, and, and Persian and kingdoms with one another, but he had done that and, and been ruling over the two for some 30 years before this Babylonian episode, and then he continued for some 10 years after that before he, he, he died. But uh, for, for uh, all the details, then, and the ancestry business, uh, uh, the details of that are asked you to read the article. But the Wiseman makes his case then that anything that is said uh, about uh, Darius the Mede in the book of Daniel can be uh, fitted in very nicely with uh, the, the career of, of, of Cyrus. So that's the end of the problem, if, if, if you see that that is uh, true. There, there is no separate Darius the Mede that was uh, created as Cyrus the Persian. And as a matter of fact, then this becomes uh, just more evidence uh, that this was the biblical point of view. Uh, that, that Babylon was succeeded by the Medo-Persian kingdom. It was succeeded by this Darius, Darius Cyrus fellow who uh, was the king of both the Medes and, and the Persians. Uh, so I, I, I think Wiseman's article is, a, is a, an excellent contribution to this, uh, uh, this whole uh, problem and uh, uh, commend it to your reading. Uh, if I can find the, the title... There, there was a, a something of a, a follow-up uh, article trying to 
uh, deal with uh, various verses in the book of, of Daniel that refer to either to Darius or, or Cyrus and to try to account for the alternating uh, designations. Uh, an article written by a fellow in, in the Westminster Theological Journal, his name was James M. Bullman, B-U-L-M-E-N. I don't know anything further about him. I don't know if any of you uh, knows uh, any more about him. James M. Bullman, B-U-L-M-E-N. And his article was The Identification of Darius the Mede. He essentially uh, you know, is, is following uh, Wiseman's view. It was in the Westminster Theological Journal uh, back in 1973, volume 35, number 3, page 247, the next 20 pages or so, Westminster Journal, 1973. Okay, another article I think you would find helpful. So, argument one, Daniel's too ignorant, uh, uh, or knows too much about the second century BC to have been written in the sixth century. Argument number two, Daniel's too ignorant about sixth century affairs, maybe huge uh, blunders allegedly uh, to have been uh, written in the sixth, it must have been written in the second. So th those are, uh, are major lines of thought that have contributed to the dominant uh, modern uh, viewpoint. Uh, other types uh, of, of evidence have to do, as I suggested earlier, the language. Daniel's written in two languages. And when it comes to the question of, of the unity of the book, uh, you, you know, that, that has uh, some significance, uh, too. But the, the result is sort of a chiastic ABA thing, beginning then with uh, a Hebrew moving into Aramaic at, at, at 2 4, and uh, back into uh, a Hebrew at uh, chapter 8, verse uh, 1. And so here we have these two languages, and, and uh, so the, the question is, does, does the nature of the Hebrew or the nature of the Aramaic in Daniel shed some light uh, on, on the date? You can well imagine then there have been a lot of critical studies that have tried to show that the Aramaic in the book of Daniel is, uh, re reflects second century BC Palestinian dialect uh, Aramaic, and so that, that has been argued. Uh, and, and I suppose similarly with respect to the Hebrew attempts would be made to show uh, the, the, the lateness uh, of that. And then on the other side, there have been the, 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 the counter arguments, the studies of more conservative scholars uh, arguing not so, uh, but that the language of the book of Daniel, both Hebrew and Aramaic, fit in very well with what we know of uh, these languages and, and their use in the uh, in the sixth century BC, and who as for the Aramaic, that then once again in this volume, some problems in the Book of Daniel, where Wiseman wrote the first chapter, as I said, uh, Kenneth Kitchen wrote the very lengthy and very effective article uh, on the Aramaic of the Book of uh, Daniel, and it's a very extended, detailed thing. I commend it uh, to you for the details of it. Uh, but uh, just to reduce his uh, thesis then to a sentence, what he is trying to show is uh, then that the, the, the Aramaic that, uh, that we're talking about here is what we can call you know, the Kingdom Aramaic. It was the language of international diplomacy. Uh, it, was, it was therefore the, the, the language in which you wouldn't see a, a great deal of, of dialectical differences uh, across the centuries, but it was, it, it was a, 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 a form of Aramaic uh, that was on the scene in the days of, of Daniel. Earlier, you had other lingua francas, you had other languages of international diplomacy. I think we've mentioned in class before how, for example, in, in the, the days of uh, Moses in the, the, the second millennium, that, that, that Akkadian was uh, the language of international diplomacy, as illustrated most strikingly perhaps in the Amarna letters from Egypt, where we have correspondence between Canaanite princes and the Egyptian pharaoh, and they don't write in Egyptian, they don't write in Canaanite, they write in Babylonian because Babylonian was uh, the language of international diplomacy. Well, by the seventh century, by Daniel's uh, uh, day, uh, Aramaic uh, was the language of international diplomacy, and it so continued for uh, some time afterwards. But the point is then uh, that uh, you would have difficulty trying to identify the, the Aramaic in the book of Daniel, uh, certainly specifically, uh, with, it's impossible to identify specifically the second century Palestinian uh, uh, dialect of uh, the thing. So that's uh, uh, the, the heart of, uh, of uh, Kitchen's contention. Meanwhile, other conservatives have uh, written articles on both the Hebrew and the Aramaic. Um, 
I guess it was Gleason Archer who, uh, in, in a couple of different uh, volumes, uh, handled the, the, both the, the Hebrew and the Aramaic of, of the book of, of Daniel. And, and his methodology was to compare it with Qumran Dead Sea Scrolls in both languages. Uh, there you have Hebrew text there and you have Aramaic text uh, uh, coming from there. And uh, he, he demonstrated, I think, effectively that in each case, uh, the, the Aramaic uh, represented the second century in these texts uh, was of a later kind than you get in the, in the book of Daniel. Or put it the other way, the Aramaic and Daniel was earlier than this later stuff, but also with the Hebrew. With, with the, the, the Hebrew, he tried to show the same thing, that the Hebrew written in the, the, the first, second centuries uh, B.C. Well, was of a so later characteristics than the Hebrew and Daniel. So there, this kind of detailed study, you, you know, that's re would require uh, close reading and, and some sort of judgment based on a knowledge of language that you have to make for yourself. But there's, a, there's a, uh, that whole business of the, the, the evidence of, of, of the, the language. Uh, and just one other different type of, of evidence that, uh, uh, that, that figures in the debate is the position of Daniel in the threefold arrangement of the Hebrew canon. All right? So this gets you into that whole subject that which we, uh, I think, talked about the first hour or two of this course, of the organization of the Hebrew canon into the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Kithuvim. And we, we noted then that the, the book of Daniel was not listed among the, the, the prophets, former or latter prophets, in the second section of the canon. Uh, but they're found among the more miscellaneous writings that constitute the third section of the canon. And uh, at this point, then, everything will depend on your reconstruction of the history of the development of the canon. And the critical view, then, is that, uh, that the threefold canon, you remember, uh, re reflects a chronological development of the canonization of these books so that it was only the Torah that was canonized in the, the post-exilic, early post-exilic period. And then later on, uh, third century, whatever, uh, the, the prophets were, were, were canonized. And the fact that Daniel isn't found among the prophets, then it is argued, is, is in, indicative that it, it wasn't yet available on, on the scene when the the, 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 the Vim were, were canonized, but uh, only came along in time to be incorporated into the third section of the, the canon, which would have taken place uh, and much later, and of course, in some of the discussions, the thing was still open even into the Christian period, and, and so on. But th th that's a kind of an argument that the the absence of Daniel from uh, the, the second division of, but you know, the, that argument depends on that whole reconstruction, which I uh, suggest to you is completely uh, false, and, and that therefore the uh, argument about Daniel is just as false as the rest of. The, so the, that's the kind of evidence, however, that has uh, led. To the the dominant view now. In, in addition, in addition to, to this, well, of course, the, the prima facie case within the book of Daniel itself is, especially those first person sections where, where Daniel speaks uh, or he receives revelation, and then toward the, the end of the book, where, where he is described as being involved in the writing of the book and and so on, and the New Testament citations as our our Lord's citation from Daniel 9, where he speaks about this as having been produced by Daniel the prophet. So the representations within the book of Daniel and, and the, the New Testament corroborative evidence, of course, have led to the Orthodox uh, uh, Church uh, to acknowledge the Danielic 6th century authorship of the book and these are the other counter-arguments. In addition then to this, it's time to go. But in, in addition to this, we also then wanted to, to uh, just note the, the structure of, of the, the book of, of Daniel uh, by way of, of, uh, of appreciating the unity of, of the thing and at the same time awareness of the structure uh, opens the, the window on what the main message and thrust of the book is all about and uh, Lord willing we'll turn to that next time. And then the first main exegetical thing that we'll be doing is, is the 70 weeks passage in, in the ninth chapter and I know you've already mastered the, the uh, Hebrew of Daniel uh, uh, uh,